everybody, I'm High Treason, and I'm still recovering from my losses with the 586. Maybe we'll try again another day, but all those components are harmless right now. Maybe Batman can save the day, who knows. But I was thinking, maybe it's time we had another go at the Socket 7 showdown, where I put a bunch of Socket 7 processors at the same clock speed up against each other and see how they perform at a couple of different things. So, yeah, let's do that. Why not? This is a Chaintech 5AGM2 motherboard. It's probably one of the last AT form factor motherboards made. It's rocking a Super Socket 7 CPU socket and an AGP slot. And I'm running an ATI Rage Pro graphics card with 32 megabytes of SD RAM on it. 256 megabytes of SD RAM are installed in the motherboard, and for now there's no sound. This thing needs a case to live in, and it'll get one when I'm finished with something else I'm working on. The chipset on board is a via Apollo MVP3, which I think is known for being one of the better chipsets of the late Socket 7 motherboards. And under the heatsink is a Cyrix 6x86, PR200GP. The Cyrix is special. At the time it was released, it was the most powerful x86 CPU, at least according to some sources, and we were putting it to the test, as best we can. The downside is that it has some weird behaviours and some compatibility problems. The gold heat spreader is a necessary addition to its design. The processor is known for having thermal problems and it's not easy to cool down with most older heat sinks. Also been thicker than Pentium and K6 chips, a lot of heat sinks won't sit on it properly. They'll lean to one side and they won't actually contact most of the heat spreader at all. So look out for that if you've got one. Don't let the 686 fool you. It is a 5th generation processor to my knowledge. This was merely marketing by Cyrix to try and make it look all next-gen and stuff. Now, not that next-gen, but we'll kind of test that. The Cyrix runs at 150 MHz. The 200 is a PR rating, a Pentium rating rating. I didn't just say that twice for no good reason. They wrote PR rating, and the R in it stands for rating, so they were literally saying Pentium rating rating. And I'm not going to argue with them because they're marketing and those people know what they're doing or something, I don't know. Anyway, they called the skilled down version the 5x86 and the further I stay away from that stuff right now, the better. This is a K6200 ALR, the competing solution from AMD, Advanced Micro Devices, based on the next gen 686. It's thermally better off than the Cyrix, and this model was introduced only a year after the first K5, which was a commercial failure in quite a few different ways. It was also later to market than the Cyrix by some amount of time. It is hard to find information on my particular Cyrix, as everybody seems to have the 686L variant. Lower power and less heat, basically. The K6 has four times the L1 cache of the Cyrix, 32 kilobytes instruction plus 32 kilobytes data, versus a total of 16 kilobytes on the Cyrix, as well as a faster clock by all of 50 megahertz and a better floating point unit. The Cyrix, however, uses a faster bus of 75 megahertz. My motherboard supports this well, as it has an asynchronous option for the PCI bus. A lot of systems had problems at 75 MHz though, since a PCI clock is a division of it, usually two, and it was rated for 33 MHz, which is fine with the K6 and Pentium chips on a 66 MHz bus, but not for the Cyrix's 75 MHz, taking up to 37.5, and a lot of graphics cards and NICs, and also drive controllers, had problems with this, and they simply don't work properly at that speed. RAM could also be problematic, but mine's rated for 100 MHz, so I think it'll be okay. I'm not going to flip that jumper anyway, and last time I tried I got burning smells anyway, so I'm really not inclined to. Well, that brings us to the last chip we are going to try out in here, the Pentium 200. Intel generally had a good reputation at this point, aside from the FDIV bug, <coughs> and that had been resolved several years earlier. The Pentium shares a 66 MHz bus with the AMD K6. Both chips also have MMX instructions, which the Cyrix does not. The Pentium sits in the middle on cache, totaling 32 kilobytes 
It also sits in the middle for the transistor count, weighing out 4.5 million, versus the Cyrix at only 3 million and the K6 at a whopping 8.8 .8 million. It can possibly make up for less cash with its powerful FPU in any application that utilises it. Now we just have to know, which is better? Do we want Intel inside? Inside where? You know what, I don't want to share a cell with him, officer. Do we think AMD is more in the now than the others? Is Cyrix really faster, better, as their marketing proposes? Well, let's have a look at what Topbench has to say on the matter. Remember Topbench only benchmarks 16-bit real mode code. According to its author, some of the microsecond readouts are about to hit their threshold at around this speed. He says the overall score should be relatively accurate, though. We shan't be testing 32-bit Windows applications. The Cyrix wears in fairly well, setting the benchmark for the other chips. It seems to be running as well as it needs to, at any rate. If that bus speed works well, it should actually boost the RAM and graphics card just a little bit, aiding the score and offsetting the weak floating point unit. It pulls off 534 points, maybe among the fastest socket 7s tested on the top bench, but as I'm using my own database for this, we can't really tell right now. Now let's have a look here, Pentium next. Will its better pipelining and strong FPU make a difference? Well, there we are, 509, and it's not looking good for the Pentium right now. Anyway, my money was on the K6, so would I have won this bet? Well, the K6. Remember, it has more cash than the other chips, and a fast internal clock that's equal to the Pentium. It was also later to market, so maybe AMD had time to make it go a little bit faster than its competitors. Originally, I'd written the script to assume this would be the case, but at 515, it actually looks like the Cyrix is actually faster in such circumstances, by a reasonable amount. Still, there is another test awaiting all the chips, and they have another chance to claw their way back to the top. I'm not going to give you the ramble on the game, but it's quick. It's a decent tool for these things, really. Time Demo Demo 3 is what will do. It's more accurate than a time refresh, but it takes longer because the machine has to run an entire demo. No external visa drivers are loaded. Running side by side, we can see there is some difference between each CPU. They're all working well, slogging through that brown sludge which is quick, but which one will emerge the victor? I seriously want to know, and we should find out any moment now. I expect it would sound a lot like a late 90s LAN party, with all the quake sounds playing at the same time, if this thing actually had a sound card. And the final result is the Cyrix completed the demo in 43.9 seconds with an average of 24.8 frames per second. The Pentium, despite its lacklustre performance in Passmark, completed the demo in 25.8 seconds, averaging 42.3 frames per second, which is almost double the Cyrix. And lastly, the K6. Surprisingly, it didn't win completing the demo in exactly 30 seconds, with an average of 36.4 frames per second. I suspect a K6 II would be a different story. Things like 3D Now and several other revisions might have just tipped it over the edge, but this is an original K6. Well, that about does it for the Socket 7 showdown. The Cyrix put up a very, very good fight. In 16-bit real mode it was very impressive, but the lack of much L1 cache and the floating point unit, which I think was from the 486 days and they just moved it over, did let it down a little bit. But given it's running at a 25% lower clock rate than the other chips tested, it certainly put up a good argument. The K6 promised a lot, but that disappointed me overall. I thought it would perform better than it did, and it actually didn't, so... It was only marginally better than the Pentium in real mode could, and as soon as you try floating point games in, like, Quake, you know, it's actually not that quick by comparison. It's sort of halfway between the Cyrix and the Pentium. And to be honest, the Cyrix was pretty bad at it, so I don't really know what to make of that. I think it's a viable alternative to a Pentium, but I'm still a bit disappointed with it. The Pentium's probably the best all-round CPU, where it might lack something in one area, it tends to only be marginal, and it's probably the most balanced design out of all the chips in the group. The K6 is a viable alternative to it, though, and the Cyrix, if you just want to do 16-bit 
real mode DOS games or something and you don't want to play polygon riddled games like Quake that you make use of the floating point you'd probably actually do really well so I don't know it's it's up to you but that that's about it for the Socket 7 showdown and maybe someday we'll put a Pentium 100 and a K5 100 up against each other and we'll see how they get on you know what it's like 5am I'm not going to sleep tonight let's do this let's do it now the AMD K5 PR100 ABQ, AMD's first in-house processor, they're first to use the K numbering scheme. It has a 16 kilobyte instruction cache and an 8 kilobyte data cache. And as with all other chips I've tested today, my motherboard's running 512 kilobytes of L2 cache in write-back mode for compatibility reasons. The K5 has 4.3 million transistors. Is it really as fast as the Pentium? That Pentium been a 100 MHz non MMX model. It only has an 8 plus 8 kilobyte L1 cache and 3.2 million transistors. But it runs a lower voltage, implying higher efficiency, and the onboard FPU is likely stronger given the history of Intel with this after the FDIV incident. The K5 on the top bench is pulling 382 points, which is a good performance, but let's try the Pentium. Ooh, 385, that's pretty damn close. The Pentium just barely scrapes it. Quick test, none of these chips have MMX or 3D now on board. The AMD will finish in 51.5 seconds, averaging 21.2 frames per second, proving clock speed isn't everything. The Pentium can do it in 40.6, averaging 26.8 frames per second, making it the winner of the 100 MHz chip test. I love the K5 and I'm rather disappointed with it today. It's actually hurting me to observe that it hasn't won this test. I'm half tempted to just replace it with footage of my K5166 and lie about it. But that would be dishonest and I don't really feel like being dishonest. That would be like if I went like all those other channels and bought a $1,000 microphone and compressed and based my voice to death. A bit like this because that's what everyone seems to like if they're not listening to a text-to-speech engine these days. Right, now I think I can conclude the experiment. I've got a synthesizer video coming up soon, and it's really nothing more than just some music that I made. It's not much of a video. Uh, I don't know. I just figured I'd upload it. Uh, the other one did quite well. I'm not entirely happy with things. I'm never happy with my own work. But... What? No, can't be. <laughs> the wind chip? What the... Windchip? Are you serious? Ah, oh, well, let's have a look at the damn thing. The Windchip, originally known as a C6, made by a division of Integrated Device Technologies, better known as IDT, called Centaur. Looking at that C6, if it makes you think of the C3, you're not far wrong. This is distantly related to the VIA C3. You see, after Windchip and Windchip 2 failed to really gain any market share, VIA bought the Centaur division of IDT, as well as Cyrix's processors. The new Cyrix wasn't ready and it wasn't performing that well, but VIA had just spent a fortune marketing the thing, so the successor to the wind chip is actually the VIA Cyrix 3, also known as a VIA C3. A little bit confusing, isn't it? This chip doesn't have multiple pipelines, so only a single instruction is performed per clock, but this may be offset a little by having 32 plus 32 kilobytes of cache, a bit like the AMD K6. It was also intended to be cheaper than the Pentium. So do we get what we pay for with it? I can assure you that in 32-bit code, these things will lose horribly. You might even catch one with a fast 486 if you're lucky. But from the perspective of a DOS guy, what does this thing do? Well, top bench shows surprisingly good results. It seems that under 16-bit code, the process is actually pretty strong, weighing in at 508. It's on par with the Pentium here. I'll time demo it alongside the Pentium, as this was what they wanted to compete with. The low power IDT was not designed for floating point heavy programs, so it'll slow down a little here, but overall a good performance. It gets hot surprisingly quickly for a low power chip, 
the voltage is correct, it's rated for the maximum voltage this board can give, so it's not like I could set it too high. Anyway, it's completed the demo in 39.9 seconds, averaging 27.3 frames per second. That's actually not bad. Similar performance to the K6, marginally slower with floating point calculations, it seems. Now, I believe it's only fair to point out that if we'd been doing a 32-bit test, this might have been a completely different story. I mean, I'm inclined to believe the K6 may be the fastest chip in that department, and this wind chip would really not look that good. If you know of any software that is likely to work on something that wasn't made by AMD and Intel, because Passmark doesn't, then feel free to recommend it to me in the comment section. Oh yeah, that comment section. Yeah. Well, bloody hell. I think now I can conclude the experiment. Is anything else going to jump out at me? No? Apparently not. Oh, that's good. There's one chip I didn't test, and that's a Rise MP6. Main reason being, I don't earn one yet. They're quite cheap and easy to find, and that's pretty much the reason I haven't bought one yet. Uh, that's pretty much the only CPU left that I want, aside from one that I'll probably never track down, but I am trying to find it. Uh, not going to say what that is, but, yeah... I'm trying to find another CPU. It's quite interesting. If I ever get my hands on one, it will end up on this channel. And, yeah, that Rise, I'll certainly look into getting one of those. They don't cost a lot, but it's not on the priorities list right now. I've got other things to do, and I'm pretty broke. So, yeah, now it's time I'm just going to do an appendix to the video. This is something I'm going to start doing, because there's things I want to look at that only take a minute or two, and there's no way to fit them into another video. And I figure I'd just tack them onto the end of other videos. That way I can, you know, mention the the device or what it does or something of interest. And it's just part of another video. Well, whatever. It might not work. It might be a terrible idea. But I don't know if I don't try. Otherwise, I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching. If you stick around, enjoy having a look at a really old CD drive. This is a Mitsumi CRMC LU005S CD-ROM drive. It's a single speed CD-ROM drive and it's not IDE. Early CD-ROM drives typically use a proprietary interface and this is using Mitsumi's own one. It has its own cards to interface it with the motherboard but you could wire it to a sound card like the Opti82C930 one I have here that supports that interface as well as three more. Loading discs is unusual in that it is mechanical. You press the front of the drive in and it springs out. A little lift up to load or remove discs, and the construction is really quite sturdy. Quite a lot of metal inside there, and the casing's really, really thick. That eject mechanism, however, is really interesting. I always thought they should be mechanical, because if a disc gets left in, I can remove it without having to turn the machine on. The drive does have an audio output at the front and back, and the interface card acts as a simple pass-through for the internal one. You can always loop it back into the sound card at its line level, but you might need a voltage divider of some type on the line if you're running an original sound blast like I am, as it only has mic input. It also requires a special driver, but with that comes Play CD, which allows you to play audio CDs. But the nifty trick is that you can actually exit Play CD, and the CD will just keep playing on its own, allowing you to go back to your operating system. You could even start Windows, and it won't stop the CD drive unless you try to access it. Well, that's all for today, so I'm High Treason, and I'll see you later. I'm sure somebody's waiting for me to say something about the Google Plus comments. I stopped caring about that stuff a long time ago. We all know YouTube sucks by now. And that saying of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, well, it was already broken, so it's hardly like they really broke anything. I'm not saying I like it. I don't like it, but... Whatever, I'll just deal with it. There's nothing I can do about it. Thanks for watching.